We, we think of uh, Rosh Hashanah, which is this coming Shabbos, as uh, the anniversary of the creation of the universe. And in a certain sense, that's right. But there is a detail which needs to be understood. There is a custom that some people have tomorrow morning at Shachris to read the verses from the beginning of Genesis which deal with the creation of the first day. And on Tuesday, we'll read the verses that deal with the second day. And on Wednesday, the third day, third day, and the fourth, Thursday, the fourth day, and Friday, the fifth day. And Shabbos, we'll read the verses that describe the sixth day. Why are we doing that? Because according to the official calendar, Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of Adam. As I say in the title, Rosh Hashanah as the sixth day of creation. According to the official calendar, it's not the anniversary of the first day of creation, creation out of nothing, so to speak, yesh mayayin. No, it's the anniversary of the sixth day of creation. Why would we do it that way? Why we? Why would the Baruch Hu want to um, create a memorial for the creation by celebrating the sixth day rather than the first day? I think there is a, a deep idea here, which is an idea you find in Jewish philosophical sources and Kabbalistic sources, which has played a role not only here, but in many other places. And this idea is expressed by some words that we have in Lecha Doidi. Sof ma'aseh b'machshava t'chila. That which is last in action is first in thought. That which is last in action is first in thought. What kind of category does that describe? Something that's last in action and first in thought. The answer is it describes a purpose, a goal. Let me give you a practical example. Kids in high school, and he thinks, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a doctor. Maybe his father's a doctor. Knows what medicine is like. Hmm. I'm a junior in high school. How am I going to become a doctor? Well, let's see. You know, a doctor has to go to medical school. How do you get to medical school? Well, you have to go to college. And in order to get into good medical school, you better go to a college that has a good undergraduate science program or pre-med program, like Johns Hopkins, where I used to teach. Um, and now I'm in high school. So how am I going to go from high school into Johns Hopkins or some other undergraduate program that has a good pre-med program. Well, I better learn science. I better do some extracurricular science projects and get good recommendations from my science teachers. Uh, maybe some uh, community work which shows that I have a certain sympathy for people who are in need. These are the things which would help get me into a pre-med program. So what is his thought process? I want to be a doctor. That's a, prog that's a program for 20 years from now. How am I going to get there? He starts working backwards. To be a doctor means medical school. Medical school requires an undergraduate education with a good pre-med program. Undergraduate education means I, in high school, have to get into a good pre-med program. Now starts the active part. He works on his high school record. He gets into college. Then he gets into medical school. There he becomes a doctor. So being a doctor is the first thing in thought that was his goal. That's where he started his thinking process from. When it comes to implementing his thoughts, becoming a doctor is the end. That's what the birds in the, in the L'chadoidi, um, in the end, the end in action, the first in thought, describe. They describe a purpose or a goal. But now, in the deeper literature, it's not just that you choose a goal and then you work to get there, and the goal happens at the end. The idea of the goal accompanies you the whole time in getting to the goal. 
So for example, let's say you're still in high school and you're thinking of, well, four years in, in undergraduate uh, college and four years in medical school and then and you find out that there's a school that has a seven-year BAMD program where you can do it in seven years instead of eight. You may change your plans. Gee, Hopkins doesn't have such a program, but another school does. Maybe it isn't a good idea to go to Hopkins. You'll save a year that way. So, uh, or for example, uh, guys who decide they want to become lawyers, and they find out that some law schools will take someone with a BA from a yeshiva to go straight into law school without going to undergraduate degrees at all. Because some yeshivas can give BAs. And he thinks, wow, so I'll just skip undergraduate school and go from yeshiva to, to law school. And yeshivas like, uh, law schools like yeshiva students. So they've had a lot, a lot of legal training. So the idea of the end the companies use the whole way, and it may change the way you implement the strategy as you go along when you learn more things or, or more new resources become available. It accompanies the whole way. So it's not just that it's first in thought, but it's the continuing thought that guides all of the action to getting to the goal. Okay, so now, what is the goal of the creation? Here the answer is simple, but I want to give you a proof to it that the, the Maharal says, which I think illustrates it and... and expresses it in a particularly deep way. There's a mission in Sanhedrin which says that when uh, there's a capital case, someone's accused of a crime which carries a death penalty, and there are witnesses. So the judges warn the witnesses before they give the testimony, listen, your testimony could have very important uh, effect, very significant effect. Somebody might die. So be careful. Be careful with what you say. Be careful with what you think. In particular, why did God create the world with one human being? To teach that someone who is responsible for the death of an individual human being is responsible for the death of a whole world. And someone who saves the life of an individual human being is someone who saved the whole world. And just as Adam said, the whole world was created for my sake, so each and every one should say for himself, my sake, the whole world was created. And that's what you're playing with. By giving your testimony, you are endangering someone who could say for himself that the whole world was created for him. So be careful with what you do. That's the warning in the Mishnah. Ask the Maharal, what's the logic in the Mishnah? Odin was created singular, individual. Well, yeah, he was, at a certain point in time, the only one there. So if something had killed him, it would have killed the whole world because there would be nothing left. And he could say the whole world was created for my sake because he was the only one there. But when there are millions and billions of other humans, so how can we say it? We're not in a situation analogous to his situation. What would be true for him wouldn't be true for us. What does the Mishnah mean that he was created singular so that we, each one of us, could be in the same situation that he was in, say the same things that he would have said. Says the Maharal, it's not a question of numerical singularity. It's rather a question of the essence of the, of the thing that is a human being. The Maharal puts it this way. Imagine the world before the creation of, of, of Adam. The 10 to the 22 stars, the galaxies, the... Uh, contents of the whole earth, what was it worth? What value did it have? What purpose did it serve? Answer, nothing. Had it winked out of existence, nothing would have been lost. Now you add to that whole creation one person. All of a sudden, the existence of one person transforms it into uh, a, 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 a creation with meaning with value and with purpose. Because the spiritual drama played out by a human life interacting with the Kodesh Baruch Hu and living in terms of morality and spirituality, that makes the rest of the world meaningful by contributing to that drama. Subtract that drama and the world is worthless. There's no, no meaning whatsoever. It's sort of like having a Scrabble set with no one to play Scrabble. <laughs> 
What's the value of Scrabble set if there's nobody there to play, to play Scrabble? So that means that, this is what the Maral says, look at what a human being is. A human being, a single human being, can change a whole creation that's meaningless, empty, valueless, insignificant, trivial, into a creation that's important, with value, with importance, with meaning. That's the kind of thing a human being is. Now, you witnesses are going to give testimony against this person, and he might die. You are threatening the existence of such a creature. It's not that he could say the world's made for him and that sort of doesn't take account of the other millions or other billions. Every one of them could say the same thing. I'm the kind of thing that could justify a whole creation. This is the idea of the creation of Adam. The creation of Adam is only, I mean, it comes at the end, and it is the purpose of the entire creation. If I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to remember who says this, but for after Adam is created, unlike the other days, it doesn't say God saw this and it was good. It says Hashem saw all that he had made. Behold, it was very good. It means putting Adam in makes everything good in a way that it wasn't before, even though some of them were pronounced as good as you go along. But Adam is not only good in himself, he has his importance, and the horses have their importance, and the trees have their importance, and the seas have their importance, and each one has its own importance. No, you put him in, and the whole, the whole of the creation gets an importance that it didn't have before. So in a certain sense, Adam is the essence of creation all the way through. Since he's the, the first thought, it should be for Adam, and he's the last in action, he's the purpose of it all the way through. Celebrating the creation of Adam as celebrating the creation of the universe is celebrating the purpose of the creation, not the mechanics of the creation. The five days that precede are only the mechanics. The celebration would be um, at, best, at best misleading and at worst really misplaced because it isn't a six-day procedure starting with nothing and then more and more coming into existence until the, pic the, the, the picture is completed, which would just mean it's a process with lots of parts. And each part would have some significance, some meaning, some role. No, it isn't like that. It's, all of it is preparation, and the fulfillment is only at the end. There's no fulfillment before that. There's another Midrash which puts this in a very, I think, another also very, very striking way. It says that why was Adam created at the end of the process of creation? Because if he's worthy of it, we will say that all of it was created for your sake. That's why you came last. But everything that you need is pre prepared for you and ready for you when you come onto the scene. And if he doesn't deserve it, then we'll say to him, the mosquitoes preceded you. Who do you think you are? Now, you hear that and you think, so wait a minute, is it better to be last or worse to be last? Midrash is telling you that it depends. Thank you very much. The Midrash is telling you that whether it's better to be last or worse to be last depends upon who you are and what role you play. Um... There's, uh, you might think in, of this in terms of lists. There are, there are two types of lists. Um, let's say I, I send you to the store and ask you to get certain items. And you look at the items, it's pretty clear to you that you might run out of time. And that being the case, you have to figure out you know, where my priorities are. And you can pretty much see from the list that my priorities are top down. Get A. And if you have more time, get B. If you have more time, get C. Being at the bottom of that list means you're the least significant. Now consider a list of instructions for making a cake. Well, all the instructions are for taking the cake out of the oven, letting it cool, and eating it, aren't they? If you don't get to that, the whole thing was a waste of time. You can't say, well, I did the first six out of ten, so, you know, I did the most important ones. No, there's no cake. 
So there, the last, most important one is the last one. That's what you're going after. If you see, look at the list of instructions, say, well, this will take me an hour, and I have only 45 minutes, should you do the first three quarters? No, I don't think so. Because if there's no cake at the end, there's no point in doing anything. Now you tell the human being, you can determine what kind of list the list of creation is. If you live as the purpose of creation, then you're the most important thing in the list because you come last, because you're the purpose. And everything else that came beforehand was preparations for you. But if not, then it's a grocery store list. And the last thing is the least least significant thing. Even the mosquitoes came before you. So what we're really celebrating here is the purpose of creation, not the not the mere mechanics of creation. Even creation ex nihilo, which many, like the Rambam and the Ramban, said happened only once on the first day when the so-called Hiuli was created. After that, everything was forming and fashioning that material which, uh, that which was not preceded by anything. The, afterwards, it's just changing its character. That means that that happened once on the first day, what makes the third and fourth day special? Nothing. That's why what we, what we commemorate and what we celebrate is the creation of Adam. In fact, now there's some controversy about what I'm going to say. Rav Desta has an essay. I'm quite convinced that what I'm saying is correct, but there are people who disagree with me. That time really only starts with Adam. I told me the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, those are descriptions of the hierarchy in creation. It's to tell you that there are different categories in creation and different, um, different qualities of beings, and they fit together in certain groups in certain ways. But real time, real time of minutes and seconds going by, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the time really starts with Adam. A similar idea, many commentators point out, you go from Adam to Noah in one parsha. Ten generations. You go from Noah to Abraham in one parsha. Then you have three parshas dedicated to Abraham's life alone. Wow! That's the relative importance of the, as measured by the time span allotted to them. The whole of the plant world gets one day. The whole of the animal world gets one day. The whole of the heavens and earth gets one day. And Adam gets 175 years. That's really quite remarkable. All the generations from Adam to Noah, which, which are hundreds and hundreds of years, get only one Parsha. So it means that this is a measure of the relative importance and the nature of the categories. But really, the creation starts to function when Adam is there. Just as the Maharal said, if before Adam the whole of the creation had, had, had been annihilated, it had lost nothing. It would be like throwing out the, the spoiled batter of the cake that never got baked. Worthless. Just throw it out. So, we have to understand that in Rosh Hashanah, we we are commemorating the, the creation of Adam. We have to look back and ask what, what, how we're living out that in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, um, in the celebration of it and in the, in the lessons of it. When you think of Musaf um, on, on Rosh Hashanah and you have Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofros, expressing God's kingship over the world and the things in the world that he pays attention to and takes account of, which is always human behavior, and the shofar that was blown at, at Sinai and that will be blown when the Mashiach comes, the Kedus Yitzchak, all of it is human history. We don't celebrate the separating of the, of the, of the light and the darkness, or separating the waters above the rakia and below the rakia, or the uh, vegetation. We don't, we don't celebrate that. We don't talk about that. We don't ruminate on that. The whole subject matter 
is the creation of the creation of Adam. Now, then the question is, what about Adam? What is it about Adam that that carries this significance? And and uh, what is it about Adam that that uh, that we have to look for our place in? And here, you have two visions of Adam's position in the world. I'm now trying to quote what I remember of the t- teachings of Rabbi Yeshua Bar Soloveitchik, from whom I heard many, many, many sure many years ago. In fact, chapter one, Adam is created, and they're told, multiply, have be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. This is a physical charge to deal with the creation in a certain way, in particular the earth in a certain way. Fill the earth and subdue it, conquer it, control it. By the way, um, you know about the Tower of Babel, Migdal Bovel, and that they all had one idea, one language, one plan, because Baruch will punish them. What did they do wrong? What was their crime? So the oral tradition has many descriptions of what the crime is. The Arachayim, I would say perhaps uncharacteristically, says you, the oral tradition has many explanations, but in the verses themselves, you have a direct expression of the crime, word for word. You don't need to have any supplementary material to understand this crime. Because Baruch said, fill the earth and subdue it. And they said, we're building a tower so we won't be scattered over the earth. Isn't that a big enough crime? Because Baruch said, fill the earth. They said, no, we're not doing that. Thank you. We're staying in one place, in one valley, concentrated here. Well, that's just the direct rebellion against what the Kodesh Baruch told them to do. So it means that the purpose of at least the earth is to support human existence. And since that's its purpose, human beings have the authority and the responsibility to tame it, control it, build it, develop it, to create larger and larger human populations, which can subdue the whole, the whole of, the, of the earth. That's one description of what mankind is supposed to accomplish. The second description is found in chapters, in chapters 2 and 3, where there's a place called Gan Eden, Garden of Eden, and Adam is there, and then Adam and Chava are there, and there's the tree of knowledge, which they're forbidden to eat from. And as some say, there's a positive mitzvah to eat from the rest of the trees. There's a, a relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu of moral responsibility, accountability. God speaks to Adam, in which case he has a prophet, so he has the pinnacle of spirituality. Now, there are not two stories of creation and two authors of the stories and those kinds of fantasies. That's just uh, foolishness. The Rambam himself says, obviously, this all took place on the sixth day. And he qualifies it by saying that the laws of nature that we have in place weren't in place at that time, so that's why all these things could take place. And it's a style, uh, this biblical style, to describe an event from one point of view and then later go back and fill in ele- other extra elements of the event from another point of view, from another dimension. That's a style that doesn't apply only here in the book of, of Exodus. It ends with the building of the tabernacle and the sin of Nodem uh, and uh, when they get killed for their, uh, bringing a strange fire is in Vayikra. It's not a different author with a different philosophy and so forth and so on. That's the way the Torah tells events. It tells events from one point of view and it tells events from another point of view. There are other examples as well. So we have to understand that Adam has two roles in this world. One is to fulfill and control and develop the physical side of the world. And the other is to be in a covenant with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, 
to act out his will in the world and in that way realize the spiritual potential of the world. From this point of view, it would be important to understand what exactly was Adam's challenge? In what way did he fail? And this, I, the, the, exam, the explanation I'm going to give you is founder of Dessa's writings. In the second volume in the Hebrew edition, he has essays on the partios. Not everyone, but, um, but many, many of them. And the, the essay on Bracius, he, he gives this description of what went wrong. And it has a direct implication for the lives that we lead, the struggles that we face, our challenges, and what, what we need to work on. According to some, Adam's spirituality was different in quality from ours, in that he was not capable of performing a transgression deliberately. There was no temptation to deliberately rebel against the Kodesh Baruch Hu's commandment. The only way that he could do something that was wrong was to be able to justify it to himself, what we call rationalize. He would have to be able to convince himself that what he was doing was right. Which means the only challenge that existed for Adam was to think right, to analyze it right, to do it honestly with a depth of self-understanding so that he could correctly portray to him what he was doing portrayed it himself. And he did. The difference between Adam and us is that, as you very well know, we have the power to rebel against a, a mitzvah and, and deliberately not fulfill it. We have a measure of free will that he didn't have. But he had free will. There are some who want to say that he didn't have an evil inclination. That's very hard to support. If he did something wrong and, he did, and he's punished for it, there must be some evil inclination there somewhere. This description now is a kind of a compromise with the idea. He could do something wrong, but only by justifying it to himself. And he's responsible because the justification was wrong, and he could have and should have known better than to make that mistake. How does it work? It works like this. Adam said to himself, okay, I can't rebel against the Kodesh Baruch Hu's command. Kodesh Baruch Hu commanded me, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Hmm. So I suppose I don't. Well, I'm sort of just acting out my nature. My nature is not to do, not to rebel against the command. The command is don't eat, so I won't eat. What kind of sanctification of God's name is it in the world if I do basically what squirrels do? Squirrels eat acorns because they're created that way, and I don't eat from the tree of knowledge, so I'm created that way also. What great purpose does God's creation serve if all I do is carry out the way God created me? Wouldn't it be a much greater sanctification of God's name if I ate from the tree once and thereby internalized the Yetzirah to the point where I could rebel, could deliberately rebel against the Kosh Baruch's commandment, and then not? Then I'll conquer that much more difficult Yetzahara. And then I'll have won a great victory for Kodesh Baruch Hu. The sanctification of God's name will be much, much more uh, significant. Wouldn't that be a much better fulfillment of the purpose of creation? That was his logic. So you say, oh, come on, Rabbi. That's, you can't be serious. God said don't eat from the tree. Don't be so smart, you know. <laughs> Couldn't he figure that out, that that was a mistake? Ah, but you see, Rav Dester has another twist in the story. Because the Torah that God gave us has in it a rule called Horor Shah. Horor Shah means that the court can issue a ruling to do something which is against mitzvahs. On a temporary basis, the court can tell you to violate mitzvahs for the sake of a greater 
sanctification of God's name in the world. You can do that. Prophets also can do that. Machlik is whether the prophet has to be speaking in God's name or not, but they can do that. So, for example, the Gemara tells us that there was a man who rode a horse on Shabbos. Now, riding a horse on Shabbos is rabbinical uh, pro prohibition, and they executed him. Well, you don't execute people for rabbinical prohibitions. Excuse me. That's not what the halacha says. But the court can do that. Because doing that, doing it in public, is going to undermine public fidelity to, the, to Shabbos, and it was therefore worthwhile to violate the normal rules of punishment on this occasion to secure that. Another man had relations with his wife in public. It's his wife. Doing it in public is wrong against, certainly against Jewish midos. They flogged him, even though it's not a crime for which flogging is prescribed by the Torah, but a, a dramatic demonstration had to be made. This kind of behavior is in a inappropriate. Elijah offered prof, uh, prof, uh, 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 sorry, sacrifice, sacrifices to God in Haifa area, in Carmel, Har, Har Carmel. You can't do that. Once the temple was built, it's forbidden to offer sacrifices anywhere else in the world. Ah, but it's a, uh, Leo, and it's a one-time basis, and he's a prophet. can do that. So Adam said, I know that God told me not to eat from the tree, but I also know there are times when you can violate God's prohibition in order to bring about a bigger sanctification of his name in the world. I think this is such a time. Well, now you can't wave the flag and say, oh, don't figure it out, he told you not to. That's not going to work. Because that's the way it is every time there's a horror show. You have on the books a law that says not to, and it can be right to do it anyway. So this was his, his reasoning which led him to eat from the tree. Now the question is, where did he go wrong? So it does to put it this way. I'm expressing it in my words, but it's his idea. Adam did not portray to himself his own motivation accurately. He wasn't reading himself truthfully. The way he portrayed himself to himself, the story he told himself about what he was doing was, as I told you, if I just refrain from eating from the tree of knowledge, then my performance of God's will is trivial as a sanctification of God's name in the world. The sanctification of God's name is trivial. That's how he portrayed to himself his reasoning. But it wasn't true. The truth was, his reasoning was, if I merely don't eat from the tree of knowledge because that's why he created me, then my contribution and achievement in sanctifying God's name in the world is trivial. Not the sanctification is trivial, but I'm trivial. That was his crucial mistake. It means the phraseology of Kokhavi Otsum Yodi that I want, I have a certain ego in what I'm doing, can apply to the spiritual as well, not just to the physical and the public money, fame, power, desire, pleasure. No. The ego can apply to the spiritual as well. He was guilty of spiritual ego. And because he didn't read himself correctly, his logic was fine, but his, his, his premises to the argument were false. He was not portraying himself correctly, and this was the challenge. The real challenge was not ingesting fruit from that tree trunk or not. The real challenge was analyze yourself, realize where it's coming from, be willing to sacrifice yourself to God's project. And that's what he wasn't willing to do. So what he did was what we call, in halakhic terms, Omer Mutter. He did it on the grounds that he said, this is permissible. More than that, not only a mutter, but he portrayed it to himself as a mitzvah. His failure, this is, I would say, quite characteristic of Rav Dessler because he was a Musser and he was a philosopher, knowing all the Torah literature as well. Um, and he sees this as a 
failure to understand his own essential motivation, his own essential character, and how it plays out in the justification for what he's doing. So, in a sense, the greatness that he was being challenged to achieve was to give up on being great. The greatness comes from what we call in Hebrew his battles, being nothing but an expression for a Kodesh Baruch Hu in any way that he wants. Moshe Rabbeinu is described in the Torah as the Ha'an of Mikol Adam, the most honor of anyone in the world. Anava expresses itself in this kind of his battles. What is the phraseology of a relationship of Moshe Rabbeinu to a Kodesh Baruch Hu? Shechina medaberes mitoch grono. The Shechina speaks from his throat. Now, picture this. You know, what of, of Moses is there? Kodesh Baruch Hu is speaking through his throat. What, he's using Moshe Rabbeinu's voice, uh, vocal cords? He's using his lungs? The voice is the Kodesh Baruch Hu's voice coming through his, his, his vocal cords. So what is he? Just a machine? Just strings on which the violinist plays the music? No, he made himself into the throat through which the Kodesh Baruch Hu speaks. And he made himself into that by saying, I don't have to be anything for myself. His uh, greatness was achieved by turning his back on greatness. You have hints of this attitude uh, throughout Chazal. Uh, it says in Pirkei Avos, someone who runs after honor, honor will flee from him. And someone who runs away from honor, honor will chase him. This isn't a strategy, hey, how do I want to be great? I'll pretend I don't want to be great. I'll run away, and then they'll catch me, and then I'll be great. So that's a great way to become great. No, that's not going to work. You have to really not want it. You have to really not want it, which means the Kodesh Baruch wants to press you into service against your will. What happened at the burning bush? Kodesh Baruch says to Moshe Rabbeinu, go down to Egypt and be my agent for, for uh, freeing the Jewish people. And Moses says, no, no, a thousand times no. Okay, he didn't quote Shakespeare. Right? He refused in every possible way. When Moshe says to his brother Aaron, you're going to be the high priest, and Aaron protests, Moshe says to him, you're chosen precisely because you're protesting. That's why you're being chosen. Because you're the person that the Kodesh Baruch Hu wants. Because you're protesting. Because there really nothing is in you that wants it. So this was the test for Adam Rish. Now, I, as I'm going to say in a moment, I'll take a question in 30 seconds. As I'm going to say in a moment, this, this intrusion of ego, especially when it's a spiritual ego, where because it's directed at spirituality, we don't recognize it as a spiritual challenge. On the contrary, shouldn't you want to develop spiritually and so forth and so on? So why is that a problem? Why do you have to be afraid of that? This is precise to the challenge that Adam Rishon was, was facing. Yeah. Yeah, like, are we supposed to say yes when God asks us to do a storm? Or when God commands us? And not argue, not be like... Well, you know what it says? You know what it says if somebody asks you to be the, sh the chazan in, in Shul? He says, don't be like unsalted food. Say no at least once. Number one, you test whether they really want you or whether they only think that you think you need it or they have some other reason for, for, for asking you, only asking you out of politeness, you test that. But yes, you should be reluctant. Now, if you're a Navi, then depending on, well, I think, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu fought with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. Shouldn't we learn something from Moshe Rabbeinu? Should we say he made a mistake and learn better not to do that? It's not obvious. Not obvious at all. Um, I think it'll vary for, with, with their, uh, certain circumstances. You know, Yoshua Koen Godel is in Shemayim and he says, who can I send to do this, this particular shlich? says, send me. Okay, so under those circumstances, it was right to do that. And it sort of vary from, from uh, person to person. I'll give you another illustration of how this applies, and then I'll do, I'll do it in comedy. I, when I first came here a long time ago, 
Um, I had a question which bothered me, and I asked Rav Moshe Pindras when I was in Yeshiva, in the yeshiva um, this question. Uh, the Chazal, it's really not word for word the Chazal, but this is the way everybody quotes it. Piskali Peschach ke chudash l'machat, v'an yeftach l'chem ke piskali shalula. Open up for me an opening, uh, I, uh, like the eye of a needle, and I'll open up to you the entranceway to a great hall. So I said to him, why is the Kodesh Baruch Hu Kibiyachol playing cat and mouse with us? If I have to walk through the entranceway to a hall, give me the ability to open up the entranceway to a whole hall. What's the idea that I open up this tiny opening and then he opens up the, why do it that way? He said to me something very important. He said, Kochi v'yotzel yodi, that I have accomplished this for myself, is bad in Ruchnius also. And this is the chesed that the Kodesh Baruch Hu was doing. You open up, I have a needle, but you walk through the entrance way to the Great Hall, you know you didn't do that. You can't fool yourself into thinking that you did that. In the contrary, it makes it clear to you that you didn't do that. He's saving you from that ego. So I thought that was a very, very important and, and fundamental answer. So you have to be careful with, with that ego also. I'll tell you another thing. The Baal Shem Tov says, Gaiva is the Paraduma. Pride is the Paraduma. It's metayr tmeim and metami tohoru. It defiles the pure and purifies the defile. How's that? Well, a person has a certain mitzvah that confronts him, and it's a big and difficult mitzvah. And he says, oh, this is a mitzvah for big people. Big people. You know, great tzaddikim. Ich ben a klein mensch. I'm a small person. I'm not, I'm not so great, I'm not so powerful. That's not for me. I'm, uh, no, it's for, for other people, right? His humility is now his excuse not to do the mitzvah. Uh-oh. That's a mistake. Excuse me. That's what's used humility is not to do mitzvahs. Their gaiva would be metayr tmeim, the gaiva of Yehoshaphat. Yes, you're powerful. Yes, you have great capabilities because the Baruch created you. He confirmed you with the mitzvah because he wants you to do it and not to excuse yourself on the grounds that you're, that you're so small. That's where the gaiva is good. It deprives a person of a humility which will prevent him from doing the mitzvah. But after he does the mitzvah, he thinks, hey, wow, I did that mitzvah. I really did. Yeah, you're the first person, singular pronoun. I, yeah, that must be something really, you know, worthwhile and tremendous because look at the great mitzvah I did. At that point, the guy is killing him. It, it, it's metami to her. What he ought to say is, Look who my parents were. Look who my teachers were. Look at the history that came before me. Look at the inspirations that I have. Look at the friends that I have and the support that I have. How much of this was mine? And how much was there that could have brought influence on me that led me to be able to do it? I can't factor out the pieces. I can't say how much is mine and how much is what a Kodesh Baruch Hu gave me. And that's exactly how Moshe Rabbeinu was, was an honor. He was an honor because he said, I can't judge how much of this is mine and how much of this belongs to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. There's a Gemara Tanis. I'm explaining it now the way the Pritzadik explains it. Uh, one of the, I guess it was a Tana, was in the Shuk. And he saw someone very ugly in the Shuk. And he said, look how ugly he is. And he meant ugly in character, or ugly in behavior. And the person said to him, you say I'm, I'm ugly? Lech eitz le'umen sha'asani. Go to the craftsman who made me. Craftsman, capital C. And the Mephoshim tell us that it was really Elio Anovi who wanted this, this uh, chacham to have, to have this experience, a comeuppance. That's the way you look at people. That's the way you classify them. Think it over again. So Pritzadik says, the message that Ilyo was giving to that, to that chacham was this. You get out of bed every morning. Your goal for the day is to be perfect. You want to do everything right. Every mitzvah with kavana. That's your goal. Maybe you'll slip, but that's your goal. I get out of bed in the morning. My goal is to be decent, not to commit gross averis. Maybe a few here and there, but you know, they're the smaller ones. And to do one or two important mitzvahs, right? Who says your struggle to reach your goal is dearer to Kodesh Baruch Hu than my struggle to reach my goal? If you imagine the, the, uh, a ladder of accomplishment from zero to 100, you're starting out at 78, and you're moving up to 98. Wow, that's really exciting. 
I'm starting out at 20 and moving to 40. But we each moved 20 spices. You didn't put yourself on at 78. Somebody else put you there. Because you a range, you should start there. You got 20 points. I also got 20 points. Who says you're any better than I am? Don't look at what I'm doing. Look at how much of what I'm doing is mine. Well, Shabbana says, of course, my performance is greater than others. Ramchal says in the Messiah Shoah, what is Anova? Anova is I don't deserve praise and credit for my greatness. Not that I'm not great. As some people say, God, don't make junk. Of course you're great. Of course you have great qualities. But how much of it is you and how much of it is what HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave you? So the Balgaiva is someone who says, I'm worthy of praise for my greatness because I made it for myself. And the Anov is a person who says, I'm not worthy of praise because I can't calculate how much of it is mine. And when I look at somebody else, it could be his mediocre performance is a better accomplishment than my superb performance because he started off with much less. And he pushed himself up. And I pushed myself up, but who knows if I pushed myself up any, any more than he did. So this is the way, a way of avoiding uh, this kind of gaiva in, in ruchnius. Now, I think for us, it's very difficult. It's very difficult, very subtle, because if you demand of yourself ideal motivation, you're going to give up the whole battle. The Bali Musa taught us, on the basis of thinking like Rav Dessler, um, the Bali Musa taught us that you go into the depths of your motivation, you're likely to find a swamp. And that can make you just depressed and dispirited and um, you give up and say it's just as, as hopeless to overcome. If you do the right thing, that's a great accomplishment. If you do the right thing for a correct but lower motivation, like for reward, doing something for reward is fine, it's okay, you'll get a reward. You're doing the Kodesh Baruch Hu's It's just that there are higher and more exalted motivations that you should work to grow into. There's nothing wrong with doing something for, for, for schar and avoid, avoid ownership. Kodesh Baruch Hu set up schar and ownership and told us about it. He told us about it because he wants it to be a motivation. He wants you to outgrow the motivation. That's fine. It doesn't mean it's, it's not a kosher motivation. It's a fine motivation. So to say to a person, don't do anything if any ego is involved, is, is suicide. There's going to be ego involved. In fact, the Akdama to Shara Yosher, Shemesh Kav says it's impossible to avoid. But uh, to appreciate that, one shouldn't be um, overwhelmed by it, and one shouldn't be distorted by it, that's something which we have to be on the lookout for. Um, I'll give you one example. Now, those who have been listening to the recordings have probably heard this a bunch of times, but um, I think it's, a, it's an example which, which illustrates the idea. Let's say I've decided to work on my hospitality. And my resolution is Friday night, I'm going to look around in shul and see if there's somebody who isn't part of the community. And if he is, I'm going to offer him hospitality. Fine, it comes Friday night. So Baruch I'm sitting down, I see him. There he is. There he is in the corner. Aha, he's definitely not familiar here. Right at the davening, he's my guest. There he is, my guest. So the last day, I don't alarm, it's finished. And I get up and I turn towards his seat. Oh, hmm, but gee, there's Ruvain. And hmm, he's, he's like three steps ahead of me and he's going in that direction. He, he couldn't be going to the corner, to the, to the guest, to, to my guest. Yeah, he's going to him. Look, he's offering him hospitality. And the guy said, yes, and they're walking off together. What a tragedy, I lost my mitzvah. Yeah, really, what a tragedy. Now, yes, how does the Kodesh Baruch Hu look at this? Well, the guest got hospitality, and Reuven got a mitzvah, and I get credit for the mitzvah because I wanted to do the mitzvah. From Kodesh Baruch Hu's point of view, it's win, win, win. Why am I devastated? Because of my spiritual ego, that's why. But I wanted to do the precious mitzvah. I wasn't looking at it from Kodesh Baruch Hu's point of view. I wasn't seeing the real ruchnius in the situation. That was an expression of my ego. No, what will happen if I compete for the mitzvah? What will happen if I try to prevent Ruvain from having the mitzvah? Then my spiritual ego, I'm going for a mitzvah! Yeah, uh-huh. And it's leading me to do something terrible. Why, why should preventing Ruvain from having the mitzvah be a kosher thing to do? 
you know, if I knock over the bookcase, then he'll stop and pick up the books, and then I'll get to the, the guest, and I'll have the mitzvah. <laughs> it could lead to all sorts of terrible distortions. So this, this challenge that Adam failed at, we are placed in a situation where we are struggling with kochi ve'otzum yodi throughout our lives. We struggle with it in making a living. We struggle with it in our, in our uh, personal development. We struggle in it with the mitzvahs that we do. The kochi ve'otzum yodi is the main, the main, a main challenge to the genuineness of our ruchnias and is a direct tolada, a direct consequence of the failure of Adam Rishon. So we're meditating on Rosh Hashanah as Yom Hadin and the day of uh, celebrating Adam's creation. What we ought to think of is that that's the source from which we came. We live in the world that we live in with its characteristics because of that Avera. And by the way, we were all present in that Avera. We are all slices of Adam's in the Shema. And one shouldn't ask. Beginners always ask, why do I have to suffer because he made a mistake? Give me my Gan Eden. The answer is, you were there. You was there, Charlie, and you contributed your myth to the collective decision to, to eat from the, from the tree. And therefore, we're all living out the consequences of our, of our own failure. But that then becomes, our world becomes a way of repeating that challenge and trying to overcome it piecemeal in very limited circumstances, doing it collectively, but qualitatively, it's a similar challenge. Yeah, questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what, are, what's, what are the steps to being, um, to being decent? Well, I didn't use the word decent tonight, I don't think. So, um, or maybe because of the Gemara Well, it, 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 because of the grace. you know, it isn't as if being decent is a, is a, is a, world, a word that covers the totality of an 18 hour daily experience with all of its details. And being decent for a different, each person will be reaching a certain level of performance that includes uh, achievements and failures with, a, with a, a, a balance that's appropriate for the stage of development that I'm at. Hopefully, you know, the ideal life would be a life in which every day is somewhat better than the previous day. But we have a concept of Yerida Lotara Chaliyah, that you go down in order to be able to go up. Of Dessler, not of Dessler, this is of the Pritzadik, and then Tzitka Satzadik has a very dramatic uh, description of this. A person who's he's doing well, he's learning well, he's davening well, he's progressing, he's having more kavana, having more, more courage and more consistency. Everything seems, to, and he's working, he's, he's not coasting, he's working. And then things go to pieces. He loses his kavana, he loses his focus, his Yetzirah becomes more unmanageable. He thinks, what did I do wrong? Why did this happen to me? So uh, uh, the Prisadic says one ingredient in a true Oved Hashem is the desire to become a true Oved Hashem. It means if you're convinced that you're already an Oved Hashem, then you've lost it. You've lost it. That isn't it. The only true Oved Hashem is one who's isn't satisfied with where he is and looks to improve and grow further, meaning that he hasn't made it yet. You're growing the whole time. You're progressing the whole time. You're very satisfied with your path in life and your upper direction and so forth and so on. You're too satisfied. You're feeling that, not that you've made the end point of performance, but the place you're on, the path you're on is fine. You're fine. Even with your incomplete performance, you're fine. And that feeling fine is something that's going to hold you back. It's going to hold you back from the efforts that you need to make. So again, here's another example of the too much of the I is in it. Here, the, if the I at least is self-critical and realizes its own, its own um, lacks, its own failures, then it, it, it's going to downgrade the ego part because not taking credit for, the, for, for what he's doing. It's a very complex, multifaceted, uh, multifaceted challenge. I'm not claiming that I was comprehensive tonight, but at least I introduced the subject and some examples of it. It's something for each person to think about in his own, his own, uh, you know. Uh, I, uh, is this really relevant? No, I'll skip it. Okay, that's what I want to